Welcome to another episode of Breakthrough Dialogues, the podcast for pragmatists and problem solvers brought to you by the Breakthrough Institute. I'm Alex Trembath, Communications Director at Breakthrough. And I'm Emma Brush, Managing Editor of the Breakthrough Journal. Breakthrough Dialogues invites leading thinkers to talk technological and modern solutions to environmental problems. It's part of our effort to move beyond the tribalism and polarization that too often characterizes environmental thought and politics today. So for this episode, we sat down with Julio Friedman, maybe the world's leading thinker on carbon capture technologies. Julio will convince you, or at least come very close, uh, that tackling climate change will require that we capture, utilize, and store a lot of our carbon emissions. And indeed, that we're much closer technologically and institutionally to being able to do that than many people might think. Julio Friedman, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is a treat. So a lot of people who might follow you on social media know you as the Carbon Wrangler. That's your handle on Twitter. Give us your elevator pitch. What is carbon wrangling? It's really three things. Keeping carbon emissions from the air and oceans, taking them out of the air and oceans, and making a circular economy where that carbon is used and restored. I had an epiphany in Marrakesh. I was at the sidebar of COP22, which was really not much fun. Uh, but that sidebar meeting was fabulous. And I, at the end of it, it all came together. And I said, I'm a carbon wrangler. This is what I do. Awesome. And you mentioned before the show that you were a fan of our first podcast interview with Charles Mann, whose book was The Wizard and the Prophet. You said you think of yourself a bit as a wizard. Thank you. I do. Uh, I consider myself wizard tribe. Uh, I also, though, uh, work with many prophets in the field. Uh, as he said on your podcast, bridging that Cartesian gap is difficult work. Uh, but since we both have the same goals in mind, both tribes should be able to contribute. And I'm glad to traffic back and forth between them. Who are some of these prophets and how do you traffic with them among them? So for me, a really good example uh, is somebody like David Hawkins, uh, who I revere. Uh, David's been at National Resource Defense Council for many years. Uh, Armand Cohen uh, at Clean Air Task Force is another one. And these people understand the limits of the Petri dish, using Charles Mann's uh, example. And their response to that is not to say, eat your peas, change your lifestyle, but they simply say, we have to start changing aspects of what we do. And uh, one of the things that I like about both of these guys uh, is that they are very open to new ideas and they are very open to technical approaches that can help solve the fundamental constraint problems. Okay, so speaking of uh, technical approaches, you've worked at Exxon, uh, you spent many, many years at National Laboratories, Department of Energy. Um, how did you go about wrangling carbon and wizarding at all those places? I spent a lot of my time actually f developing and fielding projects and technologies to store carbon dioxide underground and to understand how that works, and then later to actually capture it, mostly from concentrated sources, things like power plants or cement plants or something like that. Uh, one of the things that you realize quickly is that those technologies are actually pretty mature. And after about 10 or 15 years, I was like, there's nothing left for me to do in this space. Uh, the technology exists and it's already price competitive. Uh, the difference, though, that I realized is those projects and those technologies couldn't be financed. And the reason they couldn't be financed is because the policies were not in place to enable project financing. And so I've spent more of my time doing that, in part while I was working in government at the Department of Energy, but also in part uh, what I'm doing now. So I want to get to the policy horizon and the potential for market deployment of CCS technologies, but something you just said, I feel will strike a lot of listeners as surprising or counterintuitive, the idea that carbon capture is a mature technology. I feel like actually often carbon capture and storage gets lumped together with other technologies like nuclear or even farther afield technologies like hydrogen that are not sort of widely deployed in the world today. And the contention is that we don't have time to wait for these technologies to be deployable, to be ready, that the climate targets that we're trying to hit, we're going to hit them too soon. And so we need to rely on the more mature technologies, solar, wind, batteries, whatever. 
What do you say to that? Hogwash. <laughs> I can't be charitable to that perspective uh, on two grounds. First of all is absolutely we don't have enough time. Uh, and I certainly agree that we should put the foot to the floor on things like renewables and efficiency and conservation. Unquestionably, those are good investments. It's also not sufficient. We are all on the clock and winning slowly is the same as losing. What we need is a bigger boat, to quote Roy Scheider from Jaws. Uh, we need more options. We need additional stuff. Uh, and in fact, if we want to go after carbon emissions, then regulating carbon is the most obvious thing to do. The first carbon capture technology was described in 1930 and fielded in 1938. If you've ever drunk beer or soda pop, you're drinking CO2 that was captured by a capture device, almost certainly at a power plant. The first pre-combustion separation was done in the 70s. The first multi-million ton injection of CO2 was done in the 70s. For 20 years, we've been injecting carbon dioxide under the North Sea just to keep it out of the atmosphere. We've known how to do these things for a very, very long time. What is not mature are these integrated systems, but we've got 20 of them or so. 17 is the actual number working around the world. More to the point, what is not mature is the financing mechanisms and policy. But if, in fact, we need to deeply, swiftly reduce our emissions, here's an interesting thought. Go after the emissions themselves. Carbon wrangling. Carbon wrangling. I think the other problem people have with CCS is the moral hazard problem. The idea that if we can just capture the carbon from coal and natural gas plants and industrial plants, then we are sending a lifeline to the fossil fuel industry and that we're getting ourselves off the hook from having to deploy zero carbon energy technology, that we won't have to deploy solar and wind or nuclear or whatever as fast if we can just capture the carbon from existing facilities. Is that moral hazard problem a problem? That, I have a hard time with that specific philosophy. It essentially says there's only one right way to lose weight. And that's my way. And the problem is that that's not true for real in many markets. There's a whole bunch of markets where renewables are going to be the winner. And we've put 20 years of investment into those in terms of cost reduction and policy and additional support. And that's great. So in California, we might never deploy CCS at scale. And that might be OK. But it's not OK in Saskatchewan. It's not OK in northern China. There are big parts of the world where they don't have good renewable resources or where those renewable resources are just not competitive. Said differently, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is pretty clear about this. Seven out of 11 of their models never solve without carbon capture and storage. They can actually solve without expanded renewables and they can actually solve without expanded nu nuclear, but they can't solve without CCS. Part of the reason why is industrial emissions, but part of the reason why is that thing I was talking about. In some market, CCS is the thing that matters. For the four out of 11 that do solve, the cost goes up over 150% or so. And it's the same thing. It means you actually have to waste capital shutting stuff down and spend more capital building stuff that has low efficiency or low success. We'll see what the next IPCC report lays out, but those were Results are very robust. We've seen this result over and over and over again. And it's not just the IPCC. It's MIT. It's the International Energy Agency. It's the World Economic Forum. These groups keep doing the same thing. Stanford. They, they all get the same result. And so I can't be cavalier about that. Because I care about tons in the atmosphere. If you can stop the tons, that's a win. I feel like another part of this conversation that has gotten a lot of attention in the last few years is bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, what we call BECs on the internet. What's your take on BECs? I, I feel like a, a lot of other folks attach this same moral hazard or, or, or modeling question to BECs that it's a sort of get out of jail free card for deep decarbonization, that if you just assume that we can grow a lot of bioenergy, burn it in power plants, and then capture it, then in a model, that's an easy way to s fix the CO2 problem, but that in the real world, uh, a lot of people are skeptical. So where are you at on Bex? Well, how much time have we got? Because <laughs> you've, you've unpacked a lot of things that I have a lot of problems with. Uh, but let me start with uh, the big one, uh, which is uh, the way that these things are modeled. 
there's kind of a cottage industry out there now of people who just throw rocks at Becks. And the reason why is because the way that it's modeled is not very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. They took a kludge of a biomass module in the models, and they took a kludge of a CCS module, and they threw them together like a Reese's peanut butter cup and said, that will handle negative emissions. It is not meant to be an accurate representation in the world, nor does it represent all the other technologies that pull CO2 out of the air and oceans, including planting trees, including direct air capture. So the fact that those models come up with funky results is kind of beside the point. With respect to the moral hazard position on this, I object when people say these models rely on BECS. It's the opposite. BECS is a consequence of the constraints on the model. When you say we got to hit a two degree world, guess what? 87% of the models require negative emissions. And those models, by the way, end up getting to price points of $600 a ton, $700 a ton. At that point, a bioenergy with CCS plant is in fact the cheapest option. And it goes after the hard to scrub parts of the economies, things like planes, uh, fertilizer and soils. Like these are things that we don't really know how to get rid of yet in terms of managing the greenhouse gas budget. So negative emissions is a mathematical consequence of the way these things are configured. It is not that the politicians rely on it or the models rely on it. It spits it out because it's so hard to get there. And if you think that's true for the 87% of the models that do two degrees, wait until we get the one and a half degree report later this year. Um, that moves the timeline for carbon removal even closer. Right now, we have to start doing this at a billion ton a year scale or so, sometime like 2030. That's two Senate cycles. That's really close. 2030 is not far away. It's going to be before I retire. We're going to have to have a billion ton a year industry that pulls CO2 out of the air and oceans. So uh, if you go for a one and a half degree, you have to move it even closer. And that means we just need to get going. We need more ores in the water. Well, so there has been some recent progress on the uh, negative emissions front. Um, as you've written much about, uh, Congress recently passed uh, carbon capture tax credits. Can you tell us a little bit about why we should all be so excited about this? Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and I had a small part in this. A big part of the credit actually goes to what is now the Carbon Capture Coalition, uh, which is a whole group of NGOs and companies and scholars who came together in support of getting policy done. The most important thing this does is it creates a market opportunity. That's the thing that matters the most. Up until February 8th, you just couldn't make money building a plant. You have capital outlays up front and people would build these things and then they just keep losing money. Now there is at least some market somewhere in the form of these tax credits that allows you to get paid if you do a project like that. One of the things that's important about it is, is now an explicit price on carbon. They're saying that it costs about 50 bucks a ton so we're going to pay you about 50 bucks a ton if you keep it from entering the atmosphere. That's for saline formation storage. But if you go to a power plant or a cement plant or an ethanol plant or a refinery or a biomass plant and you capture that CO2 and store it underground, you can get paid 50 bucks a ton in the form of a tax credit. And that tax credit is good for 12 years. So you can literally take that to the bank now. You can get a loan to build the plant because you have revenues and you didn't have those before. I'm very excited about that because something has now gone from not viable to viable commercially. And that means that private capital is going to start flowing into the research and development. We're going to ratchet down the costs. That means there's going to be tax equity exchanges that are set up by lawyers and by financiers and all that stuff, which was necessary to get renewable energy to its current point of excellence is now available to some part of the carbon market. And you think something like the new tax credits for carbon capture are fundamentally different from other technology or climate policies that we ha have instituted in the past, things like tax credits for renewables or renewable portfolio standards. So what's so special about tax credits for carbon capture? It's simultaneously radically new and kind of the same. So the kind of the same part is it's essentially a production tax credit. So it functions like the wind production tax credit, which means if you do the thing you're supposed to do, you get paid. In this case, the thing you're supposed to do is not emit. That's a distinction because unlike past tax credits where you get paid for, say, generating power or generating some material product, 
Here you get paid for an environmental outcome where you're not emitting. In that case, there's a further dimension that's even more radical because the point is that is explicitly then a price on carbon. Strangely, this Congress has said it is somewhere between 35 bucks a ton and 50 bucks a ton to not emit. That's the price, social price on carbon. And that is very close to the Obama and the Bush estimates for the social cost of carbon. So that's the thing that's radical. The ra thing that's radical about it is we're saying we are going to provide a tax credit for an environmental outcome. The good news is the people who did this knew what they were getting into. There's a whole bunch of other outcomes that they want too. And one of those, for example, is a clean manufacturing sector. We're going to have the lowest carbon footprint for manufactured goods in this country by a lot. For ethanol, for cement, for steel, for plastics, for all these things, we're going to have the lowest carbon footprint. They also know that there's going to be jobs that are in this. Communities that were at risk are not going to be at risk anymore. And there's an opportunity for things like heavy equipment manufacturing, for export, that are going to be supported through these kinds of tax credits. So it is a very wide platform, but it augurs in on carbon, and that's the thing that's different. What kind of emissions cuts are we talking about if, you know, we had ideal implementation in all these kind of um, settings and also enhanced oil recovery, which is also kind of a part of this deal. What would be what would we be looking at? So for the easiest stuff, you're going to be going after the pure sources of CO2. And we did an analysis of the Department of Energy that suggested that you could get something like 40 million tons a year from this, quote, low hanging fruit, from the stuff that was close to a sink or an EOR opportunity or a pipeline. 40 million tons a year is a lot. It's like pulling 8 million cars a year off the road. And we're going to get most of those. The reason why is because to capture and store is going to be about 25 bucks a ton. So whether you're getting paid 35 or 50, you're getting revenue out of that. Uh, for a bunch of power plants, whether they're coal plants or natural gas plants, this will not be enough. Many of those will continue to run unabated which puts them at risk. Um, there are going to be a handful of coal plants and a handful of gas plants, though, which are close enough that it makes sense. They're close enough to that price point. Or they are close enough that a public utilities commission can take on the extra cost in terms of a rate hike. Or there's some industrial ecosystem that requires them to function properly. So I'm looking all these things come together the International Energy Agency spitballs it at 10 to 30 million tons a year. I'm more optimistic. I think it's going to be more like 50 to 100 million tons a year. What's interesting is with a little extra policy support, it could be a lot more than that. With a little extra policy support, with a more comprehensive representation, we could get maybe as much as 300 million tons a year. And that's a good prize. We should be shooting for 300 million tons a year. It might interest you to know that some of this is going to be written up in a report from the Energy Futures Initiative. Mm. This is a not-for-profit organization and company where I work today. It was started by former Secretary Moniz and his colleagues, Joe Heiser and Melanie Kenderdine. Uh, we've been working up a report on some of this stuff, and we hope to have it out soon. We'll be very happy to tweet that report. <laughs> so the technology is in many ways there with some probable room for improvement. We've got some really promising policies now. Another thing I've always really enjoyed hearing you talk about is what the hell we're gonna do with the carbon when we capture it. What are the opportunities for markets around captured CO2? What are the opportunities for products made out of captured CO2? So what are we gonna do with the CO2? What's the low hanging fruit for markets for captured carbon maybe in, in the next few years, next couple decades? And, and what are some, some more far-fetched or, or, or more expensive things you could potentially do with captured carbon? So in part because of the technology, in part because of the policy, in part because of market pull, I'm telling you guys, carbon is the new black. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> is getting into this business. So let me tell you what we must do, what we will do, and what we can do. What we must do, under all circumstances, we must do some storage. We just can't get the tons we need if we don't do geological storage. Because if we want to get 300 million tons of CO2 in this country, like we don't make 300 million tons of anything. Like we just, we know, have to store some of it. We will do a certain amount of enhanced oil recovery. And the reason why is because there's revenues and people understand it. If you use man-made CO2 to do that EOR, 
you truly decarbonize the barrel by about 60%. That's not my number. That's the International Energy Agency's analysis. And it's pretty robust. So you're not just capturing CO2 to burn more fossil fuels and produce more CO2. There is an actual significant, it sounds like, carbon benefit to using captured CO2 for EOR. Right. And in fact, you can change the practice of EOR to get lower and lower carbon footprints. There are parts of the country already today where they are injecting far more carbon than is produced. Um, and that carbon could credibly be called carbon negative oil, depending on how you do the accounting. That's a longer story. And I'm sure some of your listeners will take me to task for this, but I'm happy to explain the math another day. But that's what you must do, what you will do. I'm excited about what you can do. So let me tell you about my second favorite thing in the world, which is coffee. Same. So, yes. <laughs> so when you roast a bag of coffee, you emit two bags of CO2. Most people don't know that, but when you pyrolyze the bean, that's what you get. What is new is you can take that CO2, turn it into a plastic, print it out on a 3D printer, and drink a mug of that coffee with the CO2 that you just roasted. Like, that's awesome. So let me talk about what you can do with CO2. You can basically put it into three classes of things. One of these things is cement and concrete, okay? And the nice thing about that is you don't need energy to do that. Those are exothermic reactions, and so it's a question of the kinetics, but you can actually just do that in a fairly straightforward fashion. And there's many companies now that do that today, where you put CO2 into cement and concrete and aggregate. The second thing you can do is you can put it into fuel or chemicals. So you can make carbon dioxide, if you want to, into carbon monoxide or methane or methanol or ethylene or polyvinyl carbonate or any other number of things, right? You can just turn it into fuels. You can turn it into chemicals. There are, in fact, companies out there now that turn CO2 into diesel, that turn CO2 into gasoline, and turn CO2 into jet fuel. So for that, you have to put a lot of energy in. That, by the way, is a party foul for the second law of thermodynamics. You're putting more energy in than you got out in the first place. The thing is that we have so much low-cost, abundant, clean energy now that that's no longer crazy. You can imagine arbitraging cheap electrons for higher-value products, and actually scrubbing carbon dioxide in that process. And there's a handful of companies that are doing that. The more exotic and interesting stuff is stuff I call durable carbon. Carbon composites, carbon black, like goes into tires, uh, carbon nanofibers, diamond, all of these things are made out of carbon. And so in fact, you have to put a lot of energy into it, but you can do it. And if you can get carbon dioxide into these kinds of durable carbon, and we start building out of it, then there's an opportunity for disruptive architectural changes and new industries that we haven't imagined. A specific feature of this stuff that I love is that this can be done distributed. You don't have to have a big honking Dow chemical plant in order to make this stuff work. The technologies today are born modular. You can pull CO2 out of the air modular. You can convert those CO2 molecules into stuff in a modular framework. That could be done electrolytically, say with a reverse fuel cell or in a thermal process like fischer tropsch or whatever. And then you can have modular production. So you can start to imagine a distributed manufacturing economy, which is born out of carbon recycling. That's a great future and one I cannot wait for, which is why I'm working to make it. Yeah, these sound like amazing opportunities. And I think one of the most interesting things is, is um, the kind of shift in thinking about carbon, not as a bad thing necessarily. Um, but we've also talked a lot about, um, you know, the Paris timetables that we're working to address. And also, I think you've referred to, you know, cinching our, our carbon belts a little bit. So uh, how does this fit into the wizard profit framework to get to return to where we started? I mean, is there a way to think about carbon capture both as a kind of uh, innovative tech forward um, opportunity and also a way to change our behavior and um, scale back? So I recently heard an economist say that the best marginal use of capital for society, period, is to just give money to innovators. And that is true to my wizard tribe, but I think it's true. We just need a lot more wizards because all of this will make the timetables for Paris easier. All of this will make it cheaper and easier and faster. Um, we still need the profits and we still need that work, but fundamentally, we do have to lose weight. We do have to cinch our belts. And in doing so, having more options and having those be more cheap, I think, is always welcome. Uh, I was very pleased when at the Department of Energy to be uh, present at the birth of mission innovation. 
And that was an overt effort by the Obama administration and 20 governments around the world, stimulated in part by Bill Gates, to put more money into inventing stuff we don't have yet. If we know we need it and we don't have it, we better get inventing. And uh, the more of that that we can stimulate through these kinds of policies, the more of this we can incent through new market mechanisms, uh, the richer and happier our whole world will be. Absolutely. Um, what but about, oh, go ahead, yeah. This also gets to a particular sticking point mm. of mine back on the moral hazard point. One of the things with moral hazard that we've seen already was that moral hazard argument was used about 20 years ago to tamp down talk about adaptation. People said, if we even talk about climate adaptation, it will disincent mitigation. Well, guess what? We can't wait anymore. Now we're paying for adaptation and we could have saved money and we could have made better investments if we just talked about it when we understood it. The same thing's happening now with carbon. The same thing's happening now with negative emissions and carbon removal. And we'll probably have this conversation again in 10 years around solar radiation management and geoengineering. Will people say it's too big a moral hazard? It'll allow this. Well, you know, do you want to lose the Arctic or not? If you don't, maybe we need some of that. Yeah, that's the thing that's bugged me about the moral hazard argument. I think it assumes two things that are very difficult to defend. The first is that fewer tools make the job easier than more tools. And the second is that we don't have enough time. We have to decarbonize now using the most widely available tools. So, so we're only going to be decarbonizing for the next 10 years or something. We shouldn't be planning on innovating for the 20, 30, 80 year time horizon. So that, that's always seemed uh, just not to hold water to me. Well, and the punchline is we need more. We need to spend more money on more kinds of things. And we need to spend more money on the things we already know how to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's not crazy. Spending that money actually tends to stimulate jobs. It makes us more competitive. It provides optimism for the future. I don't see that as a truly resource limited issue right now. There's lots more that we can do. Speaking of optimism for the future, thank you for that cue. Uh, where else outside of energy innovation uh, do you see hope in the world? Well, I'm a fan of a number of things, that, among other things, you guys are fans of. I'm a big fan of intensive agriculture. Uh, this gives me terrific hope. Uh, uh, like you mentioned on your first podcast, uh, the C4 Rice Project is an awesome, awesome project and an example of that kind of innovation. Um, I'm enthusiastic about... Uh, some of the speed and opportunity that's provided by social networks and by things like blockchain, I try not to get too silly about it, but fundamentally there's grounds for optimism in that. A lot of the work which we've been able to get going in Carbonville has happened because networks around the world have pulled together spontaneously through social media, and it looks like money's going to start moving into these arenas through things like blockchain. I can't be upset about that. It makes me happy when I wake up. A, a wizard is born optimistic, and when I'm in the shower and I'm having a good day, that's the stuff I think about. I think about 3D printing. I think about advanced manufacturing. I think about materials by design and supercomputing. I think about human capital building and new curricula around these topics. I think about academic institutions creating whole new fields of research and whole new disciplines around this set of topics. And that's starting to happen. So I'm happy a lot of the time. On my bad days, I think about the Dilbert aspects of our uh, silly interhuman interaction. Uh, and uh, that's part of the reason, again, why I have a hard time with the moral hazard argument. It assumes that social engineering is easier than engineering. I don't think we've ever seen that. Last question, Julio. Uh, what would you say your story is in six words? I came, I saw, I carboned. Vedi, vidi, vc. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic, Julio. Thank you so much for joining us. This was a treat. Thank you for having me. That's it for this episode of Breakthrough Dialogues. If you like our show, tell your friends, rate us on iTunes, and subscribe on whatever platform you get your podcasts. We want to again thank our guest Julio, our producers. Oh, we want to again thank our guest Julio, our producers Alyssa Kadaman and Tolly Perlman. Until next time, I'm Alex Trembath. 
And I'm Emma Brush. Thanks for tuning in.